Sorry, I'm not just going to get these slides up. So, everybody hear me okay? Just a minute, did I screen share that? Maybe not. <laughs> screen share it. That's okay. Okay, so um, our love story is about roaming reference, which is um, a type of customer engagement that we use at RISE Library. Um, and it's a pro an approach that helps um, us help our customers in a better way. And um, when we're engaging, we wander around the library and we seek out customers that we can assist. So it's more of a um, customer service or retail model than a standard library model. Um, <clears throat> we're armed with an iPad that has all of our um, apps and our um, catalog on it. We have a button that says, ask me. And we walk up to people and say, oh, can I help you find anything? Or, oh, do you want me to show you how to use that newspaper table? Or you seem to be struggling with that scanner. Could you use a hand? So um, stuff like that helps us help them and helps them feel that we're approachable. Mm -hmm. well, okay. Oh, there we go. All right, so um, like I said, this is primarily to provide proactive customer service. Um, lots of people are too shy to come up to the desk, um, or they might be from a culture where they don't realize that librarians are there to help and that our help is free. So coming up to them and telling them that, oh, we are here for you, we can ask you questions, we can answer your questions, that helps a lot. And you'll notice that people that you've approached on engagement will come up and talk to you at the desk afterwards because they feel like they know you and they feel like they've got that connection. Um, let's see. Um, and it also helps us keep an eye on the library as a whole. So if you're stuck at the desk, you might not notice what's going on down the back if you've got a big library, but if you've got somebody just constantly wandering the floor, looking for kids that are getting a little too rowdy, looking for cables that are stretched across the walkway, stuff like that, um, looking for disasters in the bathroom, you can respond to those <laughs> issues as they occur and not when somebody comes up and makes a complaint about them. It just helps to keep the library as a welcoming environment. Um, it's a real American approach to customer service. Um, I have a good quote here, which is from um, Amazon, which is, think of yourself as a party host. And that's really what we're kind of doing. As people come in, we say, hey, hello, or, oh, hi, and wave to people. Oh, I like your shirt, stuff like that. It just makes them feel like they're welcome, and it helps them enjoy being at the library. And we want them to enjoy being at the library because more feet in the door means that our service is helping more people. So everybody that um, does desk duty, they do engaging duty as well. So um, we have a four hour rotating roster. So people are allocated to either the desk or the returns room or engagement. And um, they do that for an hour and then they shift to the next position and then shift to the next position. And the person on engagement, they primarily don't help at the desk because their goal is to be out in the library. But if they're needed, they have a little beeper so they can be summoned like that and they can come down from the back end and help at the desk if somebody needs them to. Um, so on the iPad, um, which is a really useful tool and it helps you be an effective helper when you're out in the library, We've got a mobile version of our catalog where you can do most things, not everything, but you can do most things. You can help people if they're just sort of standing looking lost in the science section and they hear, oh, we're looking for economics. Say, oh, well, it's right this way. Is there a particular author you're looking for? And you can search the catalog and help them out. Um, we can also sit down with people and show them how to use the library apps because that's a little um, more time intensive process and you don't necessarily want to do that at the front desk. Because um, then people might think you're too busy to help them with something. Um, and we can also use it to take photos and videos at um, events so that we can put them in our social media and show people how great our library is. Um, <laughs> okay, so like I said, you are mostly wandering around looking for people that look like this gentleman here who look like they have no idea what they're doing, they can't find something, they just have that look 
you can sense it that they are not finding what they need to find. Um, and you'll, as you're on your hour, you'll check in at the desk, you'll check in at the computer area, look for someone that needs help. If no one needs help, not always, there's not always somebody that needs assistance. You kind of do other library tasks while you're wandering around. So you um, hunt for the holds list, you've got your reserve list and you can look for items. Um, you do the cleaning check where you look for um, light bulbs that are out or look for things that need to be tidied up, pick books up off the floor in the kids area. That's a really common <laughs> engagement task. Um, and you can top up displays. The last resort is sort of shelving because um, that keeps you in one place for too long of a period and you really want to be mobile and wandering around. Um, so we've got eight basic types of requests and um, for two weeks in April we monitored what kind of requests that we got um, during the engagement shift. Um, so circulation is anything that you would normally do at the desk, you're just doing it somewhere else, IT assistance, helping people at the computers or with their phones or um, tablets. Um, directional, you all know, behavioral is something that comes up a lot in engagement more than on the other on desk shift. That's like telling kids, oh, hey, do you think that activity is appropriate for the library? Maybe take your wrestling outside. Um, <laughs> maybe quiet down, guys. Oh, you're in a big group and you're getting a bit loud. We've got a study room available. Would you like to book into that instead? Just kind of um, managing the situation on the floor. Um, and then programs and RA requests, that's, you know, you understand. And WHS is just looking for problems that need to be fixed. Um, other, there weren't that many other questions and I don't remember what any of them were. So we had, um, in two weeks we had 533 total requests and um, that works out to 35 per day. The most common ones were circulation. So engagement is just an extra circulation person for the most part, um, but you are helping the people that don't realize we can help them. So it's a good step to bring them into the library and understand that the library can do a lot for them. Um, IT assistance was also really popular, um, as you can imagine, it's, and that's both kinds of IT assistance. And um, behavioral was pretty high as well. Like, so it, it does show that us wandering around and just checking in with people keeps people focused, keeps them understanding the uh, social contract that we have as users of the library. Um, yeah, and most of our requests were between 10 and 1. Um, we had 270 requests, and then we had less requests as night, at night, as you would imagine, because most people at night are pretty quiet and uh, self-sufficient. That's my quick talk. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. We only took them for this presentation. We don't normally take statistics, separate statistics just for engagement. It was just to give you guys an idea of what we're doing during those shifts. Which actually shows that it's good to take statistics about what you do during shifts. Yeah. Oh, normally our engagement stats go on our regular um, information reference thing. So now we have Kate from North Sydney. Oh, go back. So he's yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about our staff tech skills training that we've been running. Um, probably we're about, about eight months in now and a couple of programs that we did to increase staff tech skills. Um, for all of our customer facing positions. Okay, so why did we have to do this? I think these issues are probably common to everybody in the room, but just the same. We had increased customer demand for technology assistance, lots of assistance on our public PCs. We got new PCs, we had a new print management software system, um, and that impacted a lot on the staff time. We had an increasing variety of portable devices around, people coming in with all kinds of different gadgets that we had never used or heard of or owned or seen before and wanting help with how to access things on those. Um, we had some customer feedback. I had one particularly scathing review from someone who said, whenever I come to your library, the staff don't know how to use the online catalog, which I thought that can't be true. And then I thought, actually, it could be true um, because our staff favor the 
the staff module, the desktop module, and they are not that familiar with how to search online, how to narrow, so anyway. I had to accede that, yes, she was probably right about that. Um, new PCs with new PC print management software, increased demand for e-resources, increased range of e-resources, and also our vendors changing their login systems and things from time to time. Um, so whenever we did training, it was sort of out of date within a short period of time. Um, the big one probably was pressure on key staff. We were finding that the same staff kept being called down to our customer service desk all the time to deal with issues which seemed fairly minor. Um, and that was creating quite a, a problem for particular people who were nice enough to always respond. Um, and yeah, that was getting quite hard to manage. We also got a new customer service desk. So we got rid of our huge behemoth returns and issues desk um, about 18 months ago, and we now have a much smaller streamlined desk. We have automated returns and the majorly um, self-check loans now. So that changed the roles of our desk staff downstairs. Um, and we were sort of asking more of them too because they no longer had the focus on the manual returns. So the first thing we did was created a technology skills list. And when I looked at this, I realized it probably seems extraordinary, but actually it came from our um, customer service desk roles list, which we created to deal with training of new staff. And uh, when we got the new desk for the skills range of um, tasks that we needed people to do, so then we looked at that list and we pulled out all the technology skills. So we identified all the, the tech skills that people in different roles would need. And we created a list for each of the people in those roles that they could check off against. And it's really detailed, which is probably seems over the top, but our staff really wanted to know exactly what it is that they were required to do. And also um, they didn't know what they didn't know. So we might say, you know, you can use the RFID. But there were things like, do you know what all the signs and symbols mean when the RFID doesn't work? Do you know what it looks like when something's gone offline? So it's all that kind of detail. We collected this information and then we could look at what the common areas were for training and where we were really falling down. So each staff member got a copy of this list that applied for them and they went through and picked off. They also commented and scribbled and highlighted and did all kinds of things, which was fine. So it was quite good. Um, they put all kinds of different comments there. You can see a few of them there. Refreshes what I can do. Everybody had a different way of responding to it. The one in the middle there that says not understand, I had to put that there because uh, it troubled me. <laughs> Either they didn't understand the way the thing that was written or they actually just managed in the whole time they'd been here never to use that machine, which both could be true. Okay. So then um, I've probably gone a bit too far forward. We have a team leader meeting and we talked about what we're going to do with this. How are we going to address this? Um, we've been doing training. Some people come to training. Some people find a way not to ever come to training. And um, so how are we going to do it? We had to make it something that everybody was going to be involved with. Um, so the first step was the peer mentoring. We collected all this data and we matched up people with sort of um, learning areas with people who were really confident. So I don't know if you can really see that spreadsheet. And I changed all the names, so anyway, um, just in case. <laughs> so you can see with the, on the left, we've got the skills. And then moving across, it's got staff who were needing training. And then on the right, far right, it's the staff who could potentially train. So these are the staff that were confident in areas. And then the bottom there, you can see there was somewhere, like we just had such a large number of people who needed help that we could do some group training. And, and also topics that were suitable to do with group training which not everything is. So each person was matched with their peer. They were given work time to um, go through items on their checklist. They just put the checklist with them and worked through and moved around and did whatever they needed. We asked them to try and schedule one hour each week during the month of February. We decided that February was going to be our month for doing this, and we gave it a dorky name. Because if you don't give things a dorky name, are you even a librarian? <laughs> so. Tech Fest February was what we decided to do. Um, we just thought we needed everybody to be focusing on the same thing for at least a short time so that we could see the importance of this and that everybody knew that this was going to be something they couldn't avoid. So we scheduled four drop-in sessions throughout February. We brought in all the devices that we had to play with. We made sure that there were at least two more experienced staff who could manage this and guide people through it. Um, but it wasn't a class. It was everybody sitting around together. We had a huge table and everybody worked through the things that they needed help with. 
the emphasis is on sharing knowledge and helping each other. So if I was sitting next to somebody else, I could, I know how to do that and you know how to do this and let's work out this and how do we log in. And so we worked through everything on the list. Well, um, particularly regarding e-resources was the main thing we did in those drop-ins. And of course we had lots of um, inducements, snacks, cakes, chocolates, promises. Um, and we scheduled these across the whole week. So um, they're on different days, different times of the week so that different staff were able to attend. We have lots of part-timers, um, so we had to spread it out quite widely. And then, you know, a celebration morning tea on top of the other morning teas. <coughs> um, the other thing we did was some group training sessions. Um, this was really for common areas and, and kind of topics that were suitable to do this with. One in particular was using the library catalogue, which turned out to be really valuable because many staff just had never used it to the extent that our customers needed help with. Databases. We did some um, several sessions on using the council website. We have an extraordinary amount of information on our council website, and it's not necessarily intuitive. The library is part of the council website. We're just one section. Um, so showing people where to find that information, particularly around groups and events and programs that we run, so that they weren't constantly having to call someone to say, who runs the philosophy group? Or how do I sign someone up for this or that? It, um, showing them where all that was. And the emergency system down procedures was one we had to um, go through in small groups of people. We also included this into everybody's performance plans for the year. So everybody had this a tech skills goal in their performance plan, annual performance plan. So these are coming up for review at the end of June. So we haven't sort of seen how that's going to play out, but everybody, everybody had it, um, either as a mentor or a trainer or for some people who were particularly struggling, they had a, maybe a smaller version or a specific thing that they were working on, but everybody had it. And I don't know about all councils, but we, in the library at least, we take the PPA process pretty seriously. So, uh, so challenges. Um, matching appropriate mentors was tricky. We have a lot of part-time people, a lot of casual people, and we're open 79 hours a week. So um, it, it's a lot of large spread of hours to get people together. There's difficulty scheduling time and creating a fair balance between the mentors. So some people obviously require a lot of help, and those mentors got those people <laughs> and some people were different so we tried to balance it out the group training we always find that difficult to schedule sessions so we had to always have to do multiple sessions um, the messaging and communication this was tricky because we have maybe eight different people who supervise directly supervise staff so making sure that they were all giving the same message and promoting the importance of this and following up um, maintaining momentum was tricky as well. After February particularly, it was difficult to kind of make sure we kept doing the drop-ins, we kept pushing this along. And there's still some pressure on the key staff, particularly staff with lots of, with a high level of skills around digital resources take the load. But this is getting better and everybody is getting a bit better. So that was very, a good result for that. Um, the other thing I would do is not put myself as a mentor <laughs> because of time, because of organising all these other things like the group training, I was probably the worst mentor for time. <laughs> so successes, um, I would say everybody now has a better understanding of what's expected on the desk and who to ask for help. So instead of calling on the same key people all the time, they know that this other person is actually really good with this or that other thing. Um, there's a bit better confidence in helping customers and at least people are more prepared to try. They will have more happy to walk over to the PCs and attempt to help with something. Um, there's a bit more open sharing of knowledge and willingness to ask questions so people aren't worried about appearing silly by asking something really basic about Word. Um, there's a bit more of a culture of sharing that information and fewer panic moments. So we've also identified several staff as excellent trainers which we, we didn't really know about but through this process that they emerged as people who are really good at this kind of stuff. And so we're looking at developing those people further. And we identified the need, which we probably knew at the beginning, for more structured and regular training. And, and in a different, and a variety of formats too. So obviously people learn in different ways. So some people that mentoring really worked well, others prefer group training, some people like it scheduled, some people like to be flexible. So we need to come up with a whole different range of ways to do that. Successes, several staff excelled and not the ones that we expected necessarily. So a couple of the more maybe resistant staff turned out to be some of our most great achievers. Um, 
people who had never used smartphones before, never used tablets, were, were terribly terrified of picking up these devices, managed to work it out. They did additional research. They looked up clips online. They took all the resources that we gave them and really went for it. Um, they took, we've got devices that we're happy for staff to borrow and take home over the weekend so they can practice using them. Um, and there's a bit more sharing around of people. So people coming up to me later on and saying, okay, I did this thing, I downloaded a thing and I issued it and I returned it and, and yay. So that was kind of kind of fun to hear your colleagues really reveling in the fact that they'd done this thing for the first time. And so some of these people were rewarded with achievement awards. We have a, a, an award scheme through council where people get you know, Westfield vouchers or whatever for particular things. So we did that and we presented it all in front of the staff for those people who had really gone the extra mile with the training. And of course, more cake. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, so Paul. I'm in the city of Sydney. Expectation. Uh, How do I move the slides? Uh, yes, yes. So just kind of the click. How do I get back? Uh, yeah. So then here. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah. Nope. That's wrong way. Oh, getting all my. Nope. Uh, yeah. How do I get back? Else, Don't you worry. This technical technical hitch. There we go. And just click it once. Yeah. I'm back. Hi everyone. My name is Paul. I'm the team leader at Waterloo Library, and I work for the City of Sydney. What I want to talk to you today is uh, pop-ups, pop-up libraries, what they are, and the value of them. Trust me. After these next five minutes, you're going to want to do one. Trust me on this. So. For those who are not familiar, a pop-up library can be broadly defined as a collection of resources, either physical or digital, that is taken outside the physical library space to the public. Some of the benefits of holding a pop-up library in the community are, so obviously uh, community engagement, to market library uh, services, uh, engage with non-traditional library users, so everyone says, you know, every, we, we always do all of our um, events to library users. How do we get people who don't want to come into a library? Good way of doing it. Uh, help build a culture of literacy within your community. And of course, provide a, a avenue for proactive uh, community outreach for library staff. But before you run out and start your own pop-up, uh, you need to ask yourself a few questions. The first three are pretty much the same, but Things like, what are the goals of the project? What's your return on investment? So what are you looking to do? Are you looking to increase memberships? Are you looking to uh, increase loans? Do you want to increase visibility? And once you've figured that out, you need to figure out what success looks like. So if it's increased memberships, by how much? What's, what's a good one there? Um, also, another good thing to think about are what customers are you trying to attract? Uh, kids, adults, a particular local community. This will affect which collections you're going to use to create your pop-up. What's the frequency? One-off, uh, you know, monthly, weekly? What are you going to do? What are your time constraints? What are your budget constraints? What are the associated costs involved, which is the big one? So do you have a, any kind of budget for marketing, banners, signs? Could you have a budget for that stuff? Just thinking about that. When I go through the models, you'll see you don't need anything pretty much to start it. You just need a, a, a table, a chair, a staff member, and um, some books. But hey, uh, it's good to ask the question. You know, you never can tell. People might have money in the budget. I'm just saying, ask it. Okay, so now that you've asked your questions and you think a pop up library is a good way to go, uh, you need to think about which model, pop-up model, uh, would you be using? <coughs> so there's a couple that we use in the in the city or that I've been uh, a part of. So in the city, we have some uh, very popular uh, pop-ups at big events, such as like the Sydney Festival, the Sydney Writers Festival. They've marketed the library to a wide audience, much wider than have ever actually come into one of our libraries, and resulted in a lot of positive feedback from the public. Uh, 
I can hear you probably all saying, yeah, but that's not us and we don't have that to big festivals, but community festivals, faiths, community meetings, pretty much anywhere that welcomes the community. I've created a, um, two really popular uh, pop-ups this year at the Yamban Festival uh, in Victoria Park and Fair Day using the um, uh, Curry collection for the first one, which is uh, Aboriginal and um, uh, base collection and our LGBTIQ for Fair Day. So that were great. Uh, community centres is another good one. They could be a great way to get non-library users interested in the library. I run a successful pop-up at the Redfin Community Centre uh, once a month. Been doing so since October, it's going pretty well, so can be done. Street libraries. Now these are the simplest form of pop-up libraries and um, are largely community run. You've probably seen them all around, um, but it's a great way to share deselected books if you have one in your community. Trust me on this, I see them everywhere. And the reason why I put that in is because we actually had um, uh, uh, preschool uh, get in touch with us and said, I oh, would really be like uh, uh, you to um, come out and, uh, you know, read to the children. And we just didn't have any staff at that moment who could do that. And we were talking about options to still, but they couldn't come to us, we couldn't come to them. So we were thinking, well, why don't we do a street library and we'll just fill it for you. And yeah, that was a great idea. So, I mean, I'm just putting it there for that. So you all, I'm sure you're all, all those smiles, I'm sure you, you're just saying to yourself, I want to pop up. I know, don't, don't yell, but you're going to need a few things. So firstly, you need staff, their interest and their time. And also attitude. The thing about a pop-up library, you're in the community, you want to be out there. You don't want to just someone sit behind a desk and wait for people to come to you, not the point. So you kind of need that from them. One thing I've added in that's not in here is management buy-in helps. Really conceptualizing what good's gonna look like and what you need and what associated costs are really gonna help with getting them to give that tick. Collections, physical, e-resources. A lot of people think a pop-up is just physical collection, but you can advertise your non-physical collection, your digital collection, go iPads, pamphlets, whatever, and talk to people. Um, partners, this one's really, really important because and I'm, I'm talking about where you're planning to put the pop-up. So if you're using someone else's space, you've got to get them to agree to it. So that's always the key point to, to remember. Don't think everyone's just going to say, yeah, yeah, let's get a pop-up. It's going to be so great. No, 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 no. You've got to get that first. Uh, signage, anything, banners, signs, posters, something that says library, you know, May, you know, make it in um, lettering, it's fine, it's all good. And then you just need something to put it on, shelves, tables, just something to display the items. I've used both, so it's just pretty much, uh, for our bigger events like the um, Sydney Writers Festival and that, we have, we have custom made shelves. But for my community centre one, I use a table and chair. So it's all good, you can do anything with it. So, thank you very much. If you have any questions, more than happy to answer them. Oh, yep. So we have, uh, there's two ways of doing that. There's two questions. There's a technically based one, and then there's pen and paper. So the technical one is that we have like Lenovo's laptops, whatever, with a dongle, uh, or if the community center has Wi-Fi, you can use that and just, which is set up and you can just type it all in. If that's not working, or if the Wi-Fi is low and it's taking forever to move from one page to the other, just a physical uh, page, um, like a physical membership form, is all you need. Um, and then it's just the same process. And then when I get back to the library, I just put it all in the system. Yes, that's so, well, yeah, that's actually a very good point to point out is the point of this is you're trying to get people to come to the library. So if they're borrowing it, you have to just make it, if it's a festival, you don't even have to go through that. But if it's a community center or something where you're regularly going, like at once a month, you have to be very clear that yes, no, you want it to come to the library, come, come join us. Mm. Well, good. Yeah, I love less questions. That just means I did my job properly <laughs> and it was clear and everything was signed. So I'm fine with that. So thanks. Thank you. Now we've got me and Michelle. Hi. <laughs> I have not had an 
I'll say. So this kind of came out of, again, um, we had a reference and information services group meeting and as we we're all chatting away online, one of the questions that popped up was like, well, how do you answer the questions that you don't see? How do you answer the questions that come in online or someone comes in and asks the question and you can't help them right then, so what do you do then? Or what do staff do? How do you track those questions? How do you actually help that person when they've asked it, you can't help them and they walk out the door? How do you then help them? So that kind of led Michelle and I to have a bit of an, an ongoing discussion. So I'm in Coffs Harbour and Michelle's in Albury and this is in fact the first time we have met in person. <laughs> All other discussions have been completely online or on the phone. And we kind of wanted to share our perspectives because as we started to talk about, well, this is what we do and this is what we do, we went, oh, that's a good idea. We could use that. And that kind of led to a whole different conversation or an extenuating conversation. And we kind of like to share a little bit of that journey with you and then we're going to ask you something. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, so. Aubrey Library is 10 years old. Um, we're part of the Aubrey Library, so we have two branches. The main branch is the Aubrey Library Museum, which is a converged facility of library and museum, and we have a Lavington Library customer service branch, so that's library and council customer service. Um, these are the photos you see as you walk through our security gates at the front door. We do have another entrance, um, which is from our youth cafe. The top picture is when you look to your right, and that's our information desk. Our, and then the picture to your left is looking over our loans desk. They're both huge desks, and we are looking at refurbishing because the building is 10 years old at the moment and re-looking at our desks. Um, we have a small ready reference collection, which includes our drug information, fine legal answers, um, choice magazines. We also have choice online. And we also have a large social history collection because we are a converged facility with our museum collection. We use the Libero management system for our library management system. And we have our website and that includes our e-library pages. And it's our website is all on council. Our catalogue for our library is hosted by Libero but everything else is on our council website. We don't have a separate website. We are very restricted by our council with our website. Um, our Lavington Library captures the inquiries they can't answer through a spreadsheet, but they're very vague with what they write down. So if they get asked a question maybe about aerobics, they'll write exercise down as what they couldn't find information on. So we're trying to um, we find that doesn't work as well as we'd like. Um, we still buy a hardback copy of the World Book Encyclopedia one every couple of years because it is used and devoured by those people who still love the hardback. Um, we do have Britannica online and we're just about to start re-establishing staff training of all our, all our online resources and our reference and local history collections. Um, we do currently do online purchase suggestions as well. Okay, so COPS, we have three branches. Our, our main branch is in COPS Harbour. We also have a, a small branch at Tormina to our south and a smaller branch in Wulgulga to our north. It's roughly 15 minutes to Tormina and say, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes, yeah, to, to Whoopi. Um, we, in, in terms of our walk-ins and the way we manage those, we have our small ready reference collections at all branches. Um, they're displayed in different ways. So at Coffs, we have just one or it's two bays in a particular area. At Tormina and Mulgulga, they're simply at the beginning of the non-fiction collection. Um, it's the first bay and then it goes straight into non-fiction unless you're at Tormina and you've got biographies in the middle. Um, 
In our small ready reference collection, we include Fine Legal Answers Choice Magazine, and that's only at COPS. Within our non-fiction collection, however, we have a mix of lending and not-for-loan items. So we used to have, where you can see there, the computers in the middle, so top right-hand corner, and a big magazine shelving. That used to be our reference collection. And when we decided to pull our reference collection down to just two bays, we didn't actually get rid of any of the books, or we got rid of a few of them. We just shoved them into non-fiction and made them not for loan. Over the last five years, we have in fact been going through those and either pulling them out completely or making them lending. There still are not for loan items in the non-fiction collection. Our library website is uh, on the same software as our council website, but it is in fact a standalone website, and that's primarily because the systems, librarians, staff, of ages ago, fought very hard and had the technical skill in order to do that. And IT were quite happy to actually palm off responsibility for something, just go, oh, look, you guys know what you're doing, go for it. That has actually worked to our benefit in the long run, um, except for the fact that it's on SharePoint. Our LMS is Spidus, so we have all of the lovely functionality that that gives us. And our library website features a series of e-resources pages which usually come in under research and study, and there's also now a tab in Young People that takes you straight to study. We subscribe as well to the statewide databases. We also have Britannica, World Book Online, um, a few other odds and sods. So we have quite a few um, sort of extra bits sitting there. And in terms of how we manage the information requests that come to us, there's a couple of ones. Online, we have Ask a Librarian link on the website and on our OPAC page. And this goes straight into our LMS request module, which is divided into information requests, item requests, i.e. interlibrary loan, and <coughs> suggestions for purchase. So if you place an interlibrary loan request, it will cost you $3.50. But if you place an information request or a suggestion for purchase, that is completely free. Um, staff then sit in the back room and flick those requests wherever they need to go, depending on what the request is. Um, all staff use this form. So if someone comes in on a Saturday, when I only work Monday to Friday, and they can't answer that question, they fill in the form or they show the person how to fill in the form that's online. And on Monday, when I do get into work, um, Tony, who handles their interlibrary loan, so he flicks those questions around, and we then answer them those way, or that way. Very much. <laughs> we also, since late last year, have been running a series of regular monthly e-resource of the month training sessions for our staff, getting them to play around with our e-resources because we recognise that, that half the reason why we're getting these questions on our information request forms but because staff didn't actually know how to use the Jolly database. So let's solve that problem and see if that solves the other problem. We have been sort of pushing that extra bit out by our e-resource of the month is the first tab you see on our library rotator image on the library website when you go there. So at the moment, we're promoting World Book Online. A couple of months ago, it was Beamer Film. So if you went to our website, it would have Beamer Film up there. Occasionally, we'll promote Trove. That will be up there. We're also keeping those e-resources on that rotator. So the e-resource of the month is always the first one. And then as you click through, you'll see the other ones that we've had there before. And as, of course, we promote that every library member can access the state library's resources with our library card. Now. What do you guys do? What do you do in your library when someone comes in and asks a question, and whoever they ask the question to you can't answer it? I email someone. Why do you email them? IPads. We all have iPads. Very quickly. 
What illness are you on? Wilshire. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is on Wilshire? Who else is a, a slider slider? Come on, I know you're up here. <laughs> He's on Libero. What else is out there? What other LMS do we have? Aurora. Cersei. Stephanie. Amlib. Okay, Amlib. Sierra. Sierra. What else? Millennium. Does your library management system have a module for tracking information requests? Every single Spiders library should say yes. Do you use it? Why not? Okay, I'm coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been there for about two months and I'm going to be asking them that. So the takeaway for these two for today is they're going to go back to their library and say, hey, why don't we use our request module the way that we should be using our request module? So after I talked with Catherine before we got this talk going, um, we're actually talking to Libero at the moment to see if we can actually um, alter the interlibrary loans module a bit more and um, really use it to track the information requests and have some different stages within the information request as well. So a bit like Ref Tracker, but using the library management system to do the job for us. Sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> okay, so if you're not using your LMS to track and answer the questions that come to you in person or via email, where do they go? So you email them through. If it comes to you and you can't answer it, you email someone. I think the way it works in ours, certainly I, this is the way I do it. If I get a question on the desk that I start, I take that question away with me. And I find the answer and then I get back in contact with the customer. And I do have other staff members that come to me and say, I have this question, how do I answer it? What should I do? So I think people take personal responsibility for it, get back to the customer later. We have a subject here. So we put all the details and uh, we try to get to them. And also, we can take the detail of the customer if you're happy to provide, and maybe we can follow up with HR, and then we can get the answer to them. Then we will be getting what's happening with requests and so on. So, does anyone keep a bank of those questions so you don't have 10 people within a couple of months answering the same question and spending the same amount of time on those questions? Mm -hmm. So I can repeat it for anyone who's listening on Blue Jeans, and please correct me if I'm wrong. You have a centralised email list that the questions go to, and then when you do the answer, you put them up on your intranet so all staff have access to it. Yep. Um, we have an online information request form that the staff at the desk and all the branches can fill out. It comes to me um, and it stays on the internet and I can put where I'm at on the form mm -hmm. so even staff can go and look at it and know that it's been dealt with. Does anyone have ref tracker or something like that? None of us that rich? Wollongong uses um, just email boxes. It comes straight in from our website, mm -hmm. but are also used internally to a certain extent. So um, we will answer inquiries and we copy the answer back into that email box. So the answer is there as well as the 
question and so they get um, followed through. Right. Well, you know, these questions that you get asked are a statistic that you can provide to the State Library <laughs> when you do your information request. So I'll just buy this libraries, because I know that this works. I know that little bit where you're logged in and you can go and see what searches you've done before. Do you use it? When the school assignment comes in for gold. <laughs> do you know it's there? Do you actually know everything your LMS can do for you? So take away, go back, go back and break it. Because you're not going to know what you can do for your customers better if you don't first go back and see what your LMS can do for you. And if your LMS can't do what you want it to do, i.e. track an information request, tell them to. It's all you pay good money for. They are there to provide the product that you need to run your library site. So you need to tell them what it is that you need. You need to be the library that they go, oh my God, them from Coffs again. <laughs> because you need to keep pushing back going, no, 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 we need it to do this. I need one request module to work differently so that when an information request comes through, it's free. But when an interlibrary loan request comes through, it charges money. When a suggestion for purchase comes through, which previously we used to charge for, it's now free. So we need these things to behave differently. I need a suggestion for information or a suggestion for purchase come through, be free, but I can turn it into an interlibrary loan and not charge them. Because that's how I need it to be. I need an interline loan that comes in that I've charged them for, be able to turn into a suggestion for purchase that I refund the money on. Any other question I think? Yes. Where ten one of course I just respond. Sibica, it's <laughs> these are your vendors. This is a product that they have sold to you based on a set of assumptions. But if it doesn't do what you need it to do, then you say, excuse me, send us your post, please make it to this. We're on 1013. Yes. Good luck. <laughs> and with Libero users, don't forget to put your suggested enhancements or improvements up on the user forum as well and get votes get other libraries to vote, and then you know, a lot of it will go through with money from the user group rather than your library's pockets. I mean, we part, we part with $45,000, $48,000 a year for a product that is our library management system. So if it doesn't do all the things that we need it to do, and, and you also think of a collective, so we're part of the Spiders User Network, and as a collective, we lobby on each other's behalf for improvements, enhancements. We go, oh, here's this idea that we think is going to work for us. What do you guys think? And we'll vote. And we go, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea, but no, don't like that one. So Civica, parent organisation, turns around, comes along and goes, oh, well, everybody likes this idea but doesn't like that one. We'll give this one priority. Guys, if you really want that one, here. Half a day's work, $750. Thanks for coming. You know, either pay for it to get it done mm. or lobby. And again, it's a vendor. They want your business, lobby. Mm. And, and I think that was part of the takeaway that we had mm. when we started talking about this. Um, from Michelle's point of view, it's like, oh, you know what? I really do need to go back to Libero and go, hmm, do we actually use this better or more? than what we're doing now. And from my point of view, it was looking at how we train our staff and that if we miss people, how do we catch the others? So it really was about making sure that we focus on information requests 
the unseen ones, the ones you don't know about. They either come in through the email box, someone rings and leaves a message on the wifey phone, or someone at three o'clock in the morning has a gardening question, so they ask a librarian online. I'm not in the library at three o'clock in the morning. I'm at home, hopefully sleeping. They're the questions that we need to think, how are we answering them? Are we providing the capacity for our library members to ask them? If not, why not? If not, how do we do it? Thank you. And last but not least, imagine that I'm Oriana. <laughs> now, who's seen this before? Okay, so some of you have library managers who've passed this information on to you. If you haven't seen it, talk to your library manager about it, because this is information about multilingual health resources to use at your library. It's actually got a really great little database. Um, that you can browse by type of illness and language. And so you put the language you want at the top box and then you can find, you know, heart disease in Hindi, dementia in French, etc. Now what's really handy, now admittedly this is actually tailoring, targeting an English language reader so that you're doing the searching on behalf of your client who speaks another language because the summary online is actually in English. So it says this contains blah, blah. Now some of the resources are print, some of the resources are video. Uh, they update, the, they um, search, the, they sort the resources every three years. Um, and so that if the documents continue to be relevant. Now there will be some material that's older than three years, that's because it's still relevant material, that the key information hasn't changed. Some of the documents are bilingual, um, you know, first page is in Hindi, second is in English, others are all in Vietnamese. So it varies from place to place, but this is definitely a resource to think about when you have a client coming in, um, seeking health um, information, and you think that English may not be their first language and it may be really helpful for them to actually be able to read health um, information in uh, a language that is more comfortable for them. So um, go back and talk to your library manager. And if you haven't had a look at the website and you've got one of these already, I will put the URL around. Have a look at it. It's a really nice little database. The key thing to remember is you need to put your language that you want up the top first before you do the searching because it will show you this resource isn't available in eight languages, but you can only look, view it in the language you selected at the top of the screen. So a, not, a really nice little tool. Um, yeah. So multicultural health uh, information services, multicultural health communication service, great resource and um, I'd say explore it and um, talk with different people in your community about it as well. Now the reason I'm standing here and going, hmm, is I was actually expecting to see a person called Glenn online because he's our next speaker. And so, unless he's guest one, which he could be, yes, we have Glenn, lovely. I'll just full screen you. Hello. Now we'll do a sound check, so if you could talk at a normal level and I'll see whether we've got a, I think we're kind of at max, yeah, we're maxed out here. Oh, so. I'm about to tweet something out. Can people hear that? Hey. Yes. Yep. Good. Uh, what I just tweeted out is what I'm about to present. <laughs> so um, on, it's, that should be on the RASG 2018 hashtag. And um, so if you want, want to look at the presentation, there it is online. It should show up any moment. Well, um, 
you want to introduce Catherine or are we fine with... Go. Yep. Okay. Um, yep, Glenn, I'm just going to hand over to you now. Thank you so much for doing this. This came about as a result of um, a Vala presentation and it seemed to be a very good fit for topics which we were discussing in New South Wales and so it's very kind of Glenn uh, from Monash Libraries in Victoria. Thank you and I'm just about to tweet out the um, Vala paper as well. So that is the information that you need online. Uh, let's have a look. Let's get myself in the right mouse and thing. Slideshow from beginning. Okay. So I love this quote. It, uh, we ran a survey for um, Vala. I did a Vala paper and um, it's inspired by the whole fake news thing that's been going on for the well, it's been going, been going on forever, really, but sort of particularly about the social media and fake news stuff that's been was particularly highlighted in uh, 2016. I had some people who um, I followed online on Facebook who were posting some really strange stuff, and it, they took me down a journey that I whole, had a whole sort of fake news misinformation ecosystem that I just did not know existed. Which brings actually to this comment I've got here from a, a person who did the the survey that I sent to everyone going to, to uh, this conference. So this comment is: Have we been spending so long ignoring fake news as a thing that we have lost the skills necessary to help our own library members develop those skills for themselves? And that really very much gets to the heart of the question of of, of what I'm dealing with. So the whole paper, I've just tweeted that out. Um, it goes into a lot more detail than what I can go to here. Um, so the survey that I've given you, at people are going to this conference, is the exact same survey, word for word, that I did at Bala. So you can compare the results, which is what I'm going to do. It is not. It's, it doesn't say that it's a fake news literacy. It's fake news survey. It says it's a testing your digital information literacy, but that's the long way of saying. Let's boil it down. Fake news. I use a very broad definition of fake news. Some people use very de uh, narrow definitions. Um, I include things like visual memes and videos. Uh, things like a quote next to a comment. I include um, fake photoshopped images, uh, quotes that are out of context, misattributed, misconstrued, and manipulated. So we've got some examples here. The, you'll often see this George Orwell um, quote on the left, journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed, everything else is public relations. Only there's actually no evidence to say that George Orwell ever said that. And it's very, it's basically a paraphrase of a um, Randolph Hearst quote. But you, you see it everywhere. Um, the Archbishop uh, Hart there quoted as saying that pedophilia is a spiritual encounter with God. I first saw that on Facebook around August last year, not long after he the quote was published and that was as a Facebook meme. I've seen it twice since on Twitter. And if you go back to the original source, he's actually not talking about pedophilia. It's in the context of the um, recent Royal Commission, but he's actually talking about confession. So you can take a, con a quote, take it out of context, change the context, reframe it, and people would just respond with a, a gut response and not fact check. One that was fact checked, um, the quote from um, Donald Trump there, very famous quote only, once again, he never said it. Um, there is no evidence that he ever said that. That was made up during the, that 2016. As Abe Lincoln used to say, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. So one of the things that uh, gets often thought of as news or 
gets mistaken as news is um, satire. So a lot of, once something is shared outside of its context, like a satire news site, and people see it in their timelines or news feeds, on a social media site, um, people just often actually respond to just the headline and the snippet. If they do read through, click through, they um, often don't recognize it as being satire. <laughs> Some things you can't tell. Um, I've got here a picture of Alex Jones from Infowars. I think he's doing a very good um, Peter Finch from the movie Newsfront. He claims he's rigid did, he makes a lot of money out of it, but it is fake news. 101, it is conspiracy stuff. It doesn't make any sense. But, and you never know if people are watching it on YouTube because they think it's funny or because they actually believe it. Which brings us to um, Poe's Law. Poe's Law was originally about creationism, but you can um, take it as being any sort of extremist content that cannot be distinguished from parody or satire without a smiley or a blatant display of humour. And we'll see you examples of that later in the survey. Another thing that you'll see later in the survey is an example of astroturfing. Now astroturfing is where, particularly online nowadays, you have basically lobby groups that claim to be grassroots members of society, you know, concerned citizens, but it's actually a government behind it or a PR firm or in this case, it was um, that I got showing up here. It's um, this is one of the, the Russian astroturfing. Actually, two of the Russian astroturfing, because on Facebook, uh, the Internet Research Agency, Kremlin funded, um, in 2016 set up the um, United Muslims of America as a Facebook group, and they also set up um, Heart of Texas. And funnily enough, they both had a demonstration at the same place, at the same time, with people, encouraging people with opposing viewpoints on a hot topic to turn up, which apparently some people did. So there's an example of astroturfing with um, real life implications. And of course, Donald Trump, um, he really popularized the term fake news. And if you read this tweet, which is recent, it's only from the 9th of May, um, you get the idea of what his idea of fake news is. 91% of news net, of network news about me is negative, in brackets, fake. So according to him, if it's negative about me, by definition, it's fake. <laughs> One of the things that makes contemporary fake news different from fake news in the past is the environment in which it's propagated. So you get things like this quote from a field guide to fake news, which um, it, that fake news may not be, cannot be just considered just not in terms of the formal content of the message, but in terms of the mediating infrastructures, platforms, participatory culture. So that's about how things are shared, how we view things online in social media, um, all the comments and things like that. And I go into more detail about that kind of thing in the paper. And which reminds me of an old um, quote from Marshall McLuhan from The Medium is the Message, back, way, way back in 1967, where he's basically saying the same kind of thing. Um, all media workers over completely, um, the medium is the message. An understanding of social and cultural change is impossible without a knowledge of the way media works as environments. So nowadays, we fake news is, one kind that we're mostly concerned about here is spread through social media, the environments of, of those social media platforms. Now I'm going to go through the survey, survey questions, what people have commented. And I'm going to give you the results of the survey and compare the Metcalf survey results with the Vala survey results. And as you're going through there, I want you to think about these three quotes. And Barbara Alvarez, um, 
a cursory glance typical of scrolling through social a social media feed is unlikely to yield a critical analysis uh, but the impact can be lasting uh, Nick Enfield professor of linguistics Sydney University who has they got a fake news project there the quote from him is that the only way to change the way fake news creators behave is to change the behavior of the audience so it's up to us and the annoyed librarian um, supposedly librarians are going to help the world deal with fake news it's going to be an uphill battle though and maybe looking at the results of this survey you can perhaps see why that there's more than one way of interpreting that it's going to be an uphill battle though for us librarians to deal with this so the survey I got 179 responses for people going to the Metcalf and 179 responses for people that when I did um, the Vala one. So how good is your digital literacy? Give your social media response if like or dislike. Um, also put in share. Share comes in important in a couple of examples. So if you people, the idea is that people they chose like, they thought it was true. Dislike, they thought it was false. And I'm going to also show you the comments, oh, a selection of comments, so lots and lots of comments, which is good. Now, some people, when I do this survey, there's always one or two who don't want to play by those rules. They want another set of options. Um, same options they got on Facebook. This is not Facebook specific. In fact, a lot of the examples are actually from Twitter. So. In a way, I'm trying to simulate a generic, in, in terms of this survey, a generic um, platform of um, social media. The examples I gave, though, like, dislike, and share, are straight from YouTube. So there's a couple of reasons why I didn't give an ignore or scroll by or sort of option. One is that for the purposes of the survey, I may have got 90% of each answer that was most people ignored, which doesn't tell me very much. But I also wanted to prompt people to think about their options. Do they really think it's true or not? And I don't didn't say that people could fact check. Social media platforms did not say, please fact check. Neither did this, and most people didn't. And that's really important to this, to these results. The other reason why I didn't give ignore is that if and I've had this happen so for example that Archbishop Hart one I've seen that three times once on Facebook twice on Twitter shared by other people and I think I have a moral or ethical responsibility or a civic duty that when I see something that I think is wrong and I can fact check it and demonstrate that it is wrong that I respond to whoever shared it to say, excuse me, this is fake news and put a link to the to the um, original source or the um, something that fact checks it. So I don't really want to encourage people to ignore stuff that may be dubious. I want people to engage with it, but engage with it critically. So our first example, so I've got um, the Reference at the Metcalf results in percentages and the Vala results in percentages. Um, by and large, they're generally similar. In this one, a 1958 TV show predicted Trump. Most people dismiss this, they think it is not true. But as you've got one response down here, Snopes says, this is true, but I still wouldn't share it. And has anyone got the full episode? Uh, I will, after this talk, I will tweet out the link to the full episode. If you bother to fact check, if you do a keyword search for this episode of track down, or you can even just type in track down Trump into Google, you will get results that actually, video results from YouTube that will actually mean that you can actually watch the entire episode. So Snopes is one thing that I use. It is a really good fact checking website. So I'm gonna reference that quite a bit. So, most people got that wrong. Factually, the article on Paper Mag is accurate. It uses partisan and hyperbolic language, but factually, it is true. 
Malcolm Turnbull. This is from a um, website called The Shovel. The Shovel is a satire site. But still we got 21% and 25% likes. So people, some people thought this was true. And this has gone out to library landers. Um, so The Shovel, if you go to its website, there's an about and it says, okay, let's be really clear here. Most of the stuff on this site is made up, but we're a bit like the Daily, Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mail, just with longer articles. So most people got that one right in the dislike, say, but some people, about 20, 25% gave it a like. And that's an example of, I think, confirmation bias. This one is interesting. Now, I am aware that giving the like and dislike is a false dichotomy, but they're the kind of things that you get in um, social media sites, in social media platforms. This one is a bit more complicated because you've got text and you've got a photograph. So what is it that you're judging? A lot of people point out the spelling mistake uh, up here in military service. I didn't actually notice that until after I got the first results from Vala and people were pointing that, pointing that out. I'm a really bad speller myself. Um, so I don't think that means something is fake. I wouldn't dismiss something because of the spelling. Um, but the question is, is the fake, is the, sorry, the photo real? Is the photo relevant? And also the loaded rhetoric of the text. And Snopes says, that, well, the Snopes says the photo is true. The, fo the photo is true and it is relevant to the text. Um, got a like of 13%, it's like 83. Like I say, I'm happy not to go to judge that too, too harsh because it is a complicated one. This photo of the Queen with the assault, firing the assault rifle from Twitter, from SAS Para Ops. Um, the photo really divides people um, because, once again, confirmation bias. And we often get comments that um, things like the Queen would never be photographed in such a position. Queen wouldn't do that. And other people say, well, she's actually well known for a shooter. A lot of people say the photograph is photoshopped. Um, some people question this SAS para ops, which this commenter accurately um, describes. Some people like to point out, oh, it's SAS para ops. It's not official. It hasn't got the blue tick of verification. It doesn't need one because it's definitely not anything to do with the SAS. So 37% like compared to Vala, 18% like. It is in fact a stock photo, so it is true. So 37% of the reference of the Metcalf participants got that one right. Most got it wrong. Quite different to the Vala results. So um, I think it was 1993, the Queen visited the Army Rifle Association at Bisley and LME is a British stock photo company. So the photograph is true and it is in context of the tweet, it is accurate. This one gets um, Elizabeth Taylor and Elizabeth Munro from History in Moments, once again, a Twitter example. This one, um, we get a lot of people saying, and so what, big deal, but it's history in moments. So it kind of matters whether, even though it may be trivial celebrity stuff, it kind of matters if it's true or not, if we got some sort of dedication to the truth. The Metcalf and the Vala results are kind of, in terms of like and dislike, or almost flipped but fairly evenly divided. So this one really divides people. 
and I'm always surprised when I get comments that I don't not expecting. So this one I've got this time the comment that um, this picture is not trying to create conflict. Then I actually had two comments saying that the picture is propaganda. I don't see it myself, but obviously some people do. And um, that's really interesting because the way that pe different people can look at the same thing and come up with totally contrasting interpretations. So, uh, fact check, someone here fact checked it on Google. It is a digitally manipulated image. It is two separate photographs discovered in 2009, one of Munro, one of Taylor that were photoshopped together. So about half the people got that one right. And in fact, there's an online thing, and I'll see if I can find it and tweet it out later, um, where there's, you can do a test of, there's a bunch of photos, and you've got to try to pick which ones are photoshopped and which ones not. The average is about 50%, right? I think I got about 15% right when I did that. So I'm really bad at telling. Um, naturalnews.com, this is the source of this uh, climate change. Yes, it is a climate change denialist piece of propaganda. A lot of people twigged by the wording, which is good. Um, it's, again, one of those examples whereby you can take some scientific evidence, misrepresent it, and create something mis misleading. And naturalnews.com um, is, yes, as this person says, Mike Adams, quack, pseudoscience. I was first introduced to naturalnews.com by a, an acquaintance um, who shared a similar Facebook, sorry, a similar post from naturalnews.com on Facebook and said, ah, see, this is proof that climate change is a hoax. It's not real. And I was trying to explain to him that um, there's actually no science here. It's science free. So most people got that right. I'm a bit concerned about this 15 to 70% who gave it a like. I did this same survey about a month ago with people going to an internet freedom hack. So people who were um, basically technologists, coders, coding people and things. And it's interesting, they gave this zero like. So they are far more scientifically literate, I suspect, than the average library lander. And that's something we have to be aware of. So there's the, the fact check there. So it, the claim is false. This is an interesting one. Once again, a false dichotomy with the questions because it is either like nor dislike um, in terms of true or false. This is a, well, I give it away there at the bottom, photos and themes, real black blacktivist. We can see the logo here in the bottom right of this Facebook meme is a Russian troll account. And so, these are kind of typical, the kind of things that the Russians were putting out, uh, have been putting out over the last couple of years. Blacktivist was a astroturfing account on Facebook. And I've actually fallen for something like this as well, apparently. Um, there, I got an email just a few weeks ago from Tumblr saying that they had closed down 84 accounts associated with Russian um, propagandists and that I had liked a, a post. They didn't actually identify what post it was, uh, but I suspect it was something like this. But it gets a very high share rate. So most of these examples, I don't really look at the share, but this one always gets pretty high shares, which perhaps demonstrates that Russian propaganda works. This one, the claiming to be from the Australian Conservatives, I saw this first on Twitter. Somebody else quoted it on Twitter. And um, when I read it, I thought, oh, this is Poe's Law. This is possibly uh, a wind up. So I fact checked. And um, so we get 
somebody else down here has fact checked and it is on the Australian Conservative website, it's on their Facebook, it's on their Twitter. And so we got 22% like, 74% dislike. It is in fact true. And somebody said there that it would be more reported. Well, it may, may, may not have been very widely reported, but it definitely was reported by the ABC. And they actually, this ABC news report actually quotes the exact post, which was a motion to the Australian Senate. So this is a case where um, truth is stranger than fiction, but most people got it wrong on both surveys at Vala and here. And if you had fact checked it, only takes a few seconds, you would have um, discovered that it is true. This one, I probably got this one wrong. I probably shouldn't have done this one because a lot of people just simply respond to the fact that this is from the verified Facebook page of Milo Yiponopoulos. And um, so people often just respond to that. I should have tried to find something that was truthful, accurate on his Facebook page, but um, I did find one thing once, but I couldn't find it again. <laughs> Maybe he took that one down because it was actually true. Um, but a lot of people work out that you know, this word apparently. And this is actually fairly typical of the kind of things that get shared around social media. It's a still from a video. They're not the people are chanting. They're not chanting in English. Something is taken out of context and reframed. Still, we got a like of 6.56 and almost 9% of Vala um, on very little skimpy evidence. So that's an example of confirmation bias. You had to check it. Uh, somebody did hear um, Snopes report that it's a video showing a religious procession in Bradford, England. That was mis misrepresented as people, a process by people showing, uh, claiming that they were marching for Sharia law. So it's false. So most people got that one right, which is good. Um, but I really stress, fact check these things. Um, this one is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, a lot of people have probably seen it. Um, I know that some people, when they're actually do, do, studying librarianship, actually see this example. Um, I put this in, I have actually have used this on Facebook. I, that conspiracy theory friend who um, puts on things from naturalnews.com put up a very similar Facebook meme that was anti-fluoridation in water, drinking water. And it was one of these examples where everything it says is accurate, but it is misleading. So why would want someone want to ban DHMO when DHMO is water? So it's a actually originates from a 14 year old doing a science fair thing and um, I'm still concerned about 21 percent of people wanting to who did this particular survey very similar to the Vala survey wanting to ban water and I've done this I run fake news surveys at the Monash Public Library Service and I've had one person they particularly saw that line about GMO food cannot grow without it and I really had to go to great lengths and show them the Base, sorry, the um, Wikipedia pages saying, hey, it's a hoax because they were all set to storm out the room and drum up support for banning DHMO. So we've brought, um, I like this quote from Clay Shirky, it was from the, it was at the time of the um, US Republican con conference. Uh, uh, 2016, and it, we brought fact checkers to a culture war. So, more to the point, though, we brought fact checkers to a online ecosystem, base, and um, social media environment, which the whole psychology of it and the whole economics of it actually do not encourage fact checking, and it actually encourages untruths to get out there. Yeah. 
get myself up there. Anyone got any questions or have I upset anybody? <laughs> Do we have any questions for anyone? I need to get questions. <laughs> Did everybody actually do the survey? You see some of your quotes up there and some of those responses? Some of those going, oh, I marked that as true. Oops. <laughs> well, I suppose that was actually just one question then. Do you check everything yourself, Glenn? Actually, since doing this, I spent a lot, I spend a lot less time on social media <laughs> uh, because I realised just how, how much of the content is untrue, is misleading, and I drive myself crazy when I'm online looking at stuff and going and, ch and fact checking. Um, it takes a lot longer to, part of the problem is it takes a lot, you know, even though it takes you know, 30 seconds or a minute, that takes, it's, it's still an effort to fact check compared to, oh, that's just dodgy, or I'll just see something and not think about it and keep on scrolling. And that's part of the thing that makes it go round. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about things being shared is that there's actually no correlation between the amount that a meme or a newspaper article or something is shared online with the number of people who actually click through and actually read the article. We go back to the source. So online is kind of, it's very much impulse based. Our behaviour online is um, sort of, it's all about immediacy and, oh, I've got to not think about that one for too long because there's all these other things. And I got a lot of that comment. I actually ran the same survey at the Monash Public Library Service where I work and I got a lot of that kind of comment back that, well, you didn't tell me the fact check and, well, you know, I didn't have time. And it's the, there's a lot of evidence and I refer to it in my paper that, um, that is precisely part of the problem of what makes fake news online so um, so viral is that we are in the moment, we are at behaving emotionally and impulsively and everything's got to be quick, quick, quick. So we're reading, one of the quotes is that we're judging things from summaries of summaries of summaries. And um, so yes, I actually spend a lot less time online now than what I do because uh, I, annoy myself and everybody else around me because I fact check them. <laughs> okay, I have one question. Give me a sec. Not really a question, question but just to add that um, there just seems to be a huge boom in conspiracy theory as well. And like a lot of the ones that have been around forever, like JFK goes around and everything, but flat earth. This seems to be a huge boom thing as well, and it just makes it more likely to swim against the tide. This is not just fake news, but conspiracy theory as well. Sort of adding to the, it's fuel to the fire, I suppose it seems. Yeah, um, you mentioned flat earth there. Um, YouTube is full of flat earthers. It's incredible. And um, yeah, YouTube is what something like after Google, the second most popular um, search engine in the world. And all this pressure goes on to about Facebook and Google with their trends and things. Sometimes there's a few. There has been a few examples recently with trends. Uh, conspiracy theory things uh, showing up in the trends of uh, YouTube, but there's this really huge long tail of things, of conspiracy theory stuff. Now, someone like I mentioned before, Alex Jones, Infowars, he's huge on YouTube. His stuff gets hundreds and thousands of millions of views. And, you know, he gets financed through that in, in part. And he's quite a wealthy man now. But um, it's one of those things whereby, the, yes, it's wonderful to have information and information sharing and information creation democratised, but it, there, to a degree YouTube and social media can make um, 
oh, there's, it's called the, the Dunning the Dunning Kruger effect. Look it up. It's I mentioned it in the paper. Um, people who are too stupid to realise that they're stupid about that they don't understand something, and they can just jump on YouTube and go, well, you know, Einstein was wrong about this or this. The Earth is flat. Blah 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 blah. And it, they got um, people believe this sort of stuff. Um, but another one, one of my favourites is um, chemtrails. Sort of when you see the um, oh, people laughing at that. I can hear that. Um, when you see condensation trails in the sky, you look up chemtrails and you'll find oodles of stuff on social media about, about chemtrails, and it's nonsense. It's it's water it's water ice <laughs> in the sky. But apparently, it's killing us all. There's upteen number of um, explanations of, about what's claims about, about what's going on, but none of it makes any sense. But yet, I've, I've been at the football and watching St Kilda lose and hearing people behind me talk about how autism is created by um, massive chemtrails. So, and that stuff just did, the chemtrail thing just did not ex exist before social media, before the internet. It was in fact, the, the conspiracy theory was invented in 1995. Um, so, what's that, 22 years and they still haven't killed us all yet, so, yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from anyone else? Yes, up the back. We're getting the microphone so you can hear. Yeah, I can't hear a thing. Briefly, last night the city Hang on. There's a button on the side. Little light will pop on. Yay. Is that yes. Is that okay. Yeah. So Lee, Lee Sowers um, speaking to Hillary Clinton, interviewing Hillary Clinton last night on the 7.30 report. And um, so Hillary is, is publishing a political memoir, uh, What Happened in That Election? And um, her comment was to, to, wow, she really should have looked out for social media. And um, uh, Facebook, um, information being fed through Facebook, and making a comment that one of the um, pieces of information that was fed through to people's Facebook being targeted was that Hillary Clinton was dying. So why would you vote for a politician who was dying? Um, and there were a few other. She she basically said um, this is this is um, catastrophic for her with a lot of um, information being fed through about herself. People believing this on, on Facebook. Yeah, do you have any comment about that? Uh, you... Yeah, that 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 campaign was uh, that that U.S. presidential campaign in 2016 was the thing that really put fake news on the on the on the map. And yeah, it's it's funny. My conspiracy theory friend on Facebook who made the mistake of trying to recruit me. To his courses, that didn't go down well because um, I was fact checking everything he said, and that was all nonsense. But it's it's funny because you know here he is, he's in Australia, and most of his Facebook followers are Australian, and here he is constantly posting crooked Hillary um, things onto his on, onto, onto his Facebook, and it's like. Why oh, are you bothering? <laughs> What's it got to do with you? But um, and he was be believing that all, all that, all that sort of stuff. Um, basically, it goes back to the idea of you know whatever works, the big lie. And um, yeah, the, the whole Trump thing um, was you get out and. Well, from him and also various supporters, campaigns, um, Russians amongst them, um, you tell what people, you say what people want to hear, 
you say the worst about someone and that news gets out, even though it may be fake or misleading, that news gets out and spreads, goes viral faster and more extensively than the truth, than anything else that say, let's say you say fake, um, Hillary Clinton is dying, then people got to go and fact check that. There's various reports from the mainstream media saying, no, that's not the case, but then they report that this thing is happening, which only spreads it further, and people distrust the mainstream media and say, well, I don't trust them anymore. Um, they must be wrong. I'd rather trust this friend of mine who shared this with me. And actually, that's one of the things that on social media, if, some, if a friend, somebody you're close to, share something with you, you're actually more likely to believe it than if it's from something completely anonymous that you see or a mainstream organisation like a newspaper or a government. Um, and that's how this sort of stuff spreads. So you know, the truth gets out slower and less extensively than the fake sometimes. And you just keep on generating all these fake stories and the time, by the time it takes anyone to fact check it or to refute it, there's another dozen. So you just can't keep up. It was very smart campaign strategy. Is it ethical or honest? Is it good for democracy? No, 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 but it worked. Thank you. Okay, do we have any more questions from anyone? That would be no. I would like to thank you, Glenn, for that. Um, I actually caught your, your speech at, at Bala, your presentation at Bala, so it's really good to catch it again. And to, in fact, do that survey for the second time and give a whole series of different answers. Um, not I was necessarily going to say, did you give different answers? <laughs> not necessarily knowing the correct answer the second time round. Um, but what I did find in doing that survey is that I started to question what I was seeing a lot more. And I suppose if that's anything that we can all take away from, from today, from Glenn's talk, is you know what, fact check, question what, what's up there and really think about what's the, the message that you're sending from the library, about the library, from your personal accounts about the library. Um, and the people who walk in the door and ask you, you know, I've got a question about this. It says, you know, that Hillary Clinton's dying. Um, what's the truth in this? So thank you very, very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll have to declare it to the council. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a big thank you to everybody who's managed to stick out the day with us. Um, we'll be back again.